Hello. So um, today, um, uh, in this little video, I'm going to show uh, a new feature that um, that I just pushed to the master branch in POC, in the POC Git repository. And it's basically a feature that allows uh, allows you to um, to print and uh, you know the bytes of uh, mapped uh, structs in POC in a way that it's very easy to visually uh, identify which bytes correspond to which interpreted uh, fields or elements. So um, this is a feature that uh, we are still discussing about it. We are still brainstorming about it, uh, but we got it in master because it is already useful. And um, as I will tell you at the end of this video, um, any feedback is very welcome particularly uh, usage feedback and ergonomic or, you know, like user interface uh, sort of, uh, of feedback. So let's get at it. Um, the first thing, okay, let me get myself out of here because it occupies useful space. Yeah, okay. So the first thing that we will do is to build um, a little uh, elf object file uh, so we can use it in order to showcase, you know, to get the information that we will be poking at. Um, in this case, we will be compiling a little C program into BPF. Um, uh, so let's say long L int foo, I think function foo that returns L plus one. Um, this program I'm using, you know, this external variable because um, uh, I want some interesting BPF instructions to be generated here. So let me compile it with, uh, no, this is root uh, BPF, with uh, DCC. Let's include uh, um, the bugging information in the form of BTF. Um, let's compile, it's written in C, I want it in Fudodo. So basically now in Fudodo we have a little L file which contains this small BPF program compiled in it along with the debug information. So let's poke at it. Fudodo. Then the first thing that we need to do is to load the elf pickle. Um, and then um, and then uh, let's get let's map the elf data itself. Let's map an elf64 uh, file beginning at the beginning of the object file. And then uh, okay, so in elf object files, the executable code, so in this case the BPF instructions, they live in a section called dot .text. So let's get it using a feature from the elf pickle, get sections by name. We know this is in a section called dot .text, and we know that there is only one of those, so but anyway, we were interested in that. Now, uh, S is the section is the entry in the section header table for this particular section, the one containing the BPF instructions. So now we want to access the contents of this section. The contents of this section are determined. Uh, the location of the, the, the contents uh, is determined by the SH offset field and the size SH, SH size field, right, of this of this uh, section header entry. So, uh, what is what are the contents of this section? BPF instructions. So we load the BPF pickle, actually showing how POC is very useful when we are editing and accessing a data that contains different uh, payloads on different formats. So it notes POC notes about ELF, but also about BPF or about any other format that you may want to write a pickle for it. So we load the BPF uh, pickle and the BPF pickle it gives, us, gives us many things. And one of those is a type which is BPF instruction. And what do we want now? We want to map uh, the list of BPF instructions which are stored in that section. So how many instructions, whatever fit in the section, were at the position pointed by the section. So at this point, we got uh, uh, and the list of BPF instructions mapped into a POC array, which is INS. Let me activate the picture. So, um, so okay, very nice. I mean, let's take a look. So, uh, those instructions, this is an array of several BPF instructions here, like 
one, two, three, blah. How many? Well, let's find out. Eight. There are eight BPF instructions here. And since we have them in an array, we can actually access them individually, and we can actually access uh, the different fields in them. You can see that when we look at the, when, when POC shows us that are the contents of those structs, we can see here that there is some pretty printing in action. Um, if we want uh, uh, to disable pretty printing, so we want to see all the different uh, gory details of the structs, then we can disable it like this, and so on. So this is something that we already know. This is nice. We can actually change it, right? So um, if we wanted to change the source register, we could do something like this. That would change it to R3. Fine. However, um, this is basically when the structure that we have mapped and that we can we see here, like this BPF instruction. Um, we know that this is uh, some data that is in the file, in this case in foododo at some location. And we know that basically this is a symbolic representation of whatever bytes, bits or bytes, bits and bytes, right, that are in the file. And very often uh, we want to treat this data like this. Remember, POC is the extensible editor for a structured binary data, right? So at the end of the day, most of the time, we, what we are interested in is in this. Right? Manipulate it, read it, or even change it. However, uh, sometimes we also want to see the bytes corresponding to this. And it's also often that we want to see both at the same time. So yeah, sure, I mean, th those registers here, but how are those registers encoded exactly? Right? We can, of course, say, okay, uh, info type BPF uh, ins that basically tell us the encoding, right? Because it says, okay, so the registers is a BPF ins registers. So BPF ins registers is, uh, it has two fields, BPF rates, BPF rates is uh, an unsigned four bits. It's an evil, right? It's register is encoded in an evil. But, um, well, I mean, it's, it's uh, it, it can get a little bit uh, complicated. So um, one possibility that we have uh, and we had already to see the bytes corresponding to this map value was to use the dump command. So in POC we have a dump command that basically dumps bytes along with the ASCII representation of them. And uh, dump, we know that we can pass arguments like from 23 bytes and I want you know to see 64 bytes from there right and then it shows you so when we have a mapped value in book like this instruction here we can get the offset of it in the current IO space which in this case is the full auto file and we can see the size so we can also say okay from dump from um, uh, you know the start of this value, in this case, this BPF instructions for um, whatever size it has. So we know that this is the um, uh, the bytes corresponding to this. So what is new now? What is new now is that in order to ease this, to make this easier and better, we added a new option to the dump command called val, val for value. I don't know if you write only VAL, do you say VAL or VEL? Well, I don't know, anyway. Dump VAL, and then you just specify a map value, like this instruction. What do you get? You get something like this. Um, as you can see, it's very similar to the normal dump from this size blah, but then it gives us additional information here. First, um, you will see that after the bytes and the ASCII, uh, we also get a list of constituents constituents of uh, the mapped value value that we passed uh, to the command in this case since this uh, mapped value this third element of the of the instructions array is itself a struct right a vpf instance struct the different constituents are fields so first we have the opcodes that we can see here as well then we have the registers, which is another struct, which we, 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 we see there. Then we have the offset here and the immediate. And then, as you can see, 
each uh, name, the names of uh, the constituents each use a different colors. Uh, well, okay, the colors they repeat after after. Uh, I think we have like four different colors for this, but okay. Um, so you can basically very easily and quickly determine which bytes correspond to which field. So in this case, for example, if you are wondering, okay, where is the opcode in this instruction? Yes, okay, you have that information here because if you know how poke structs work, then you know that the opcode are the first field here and you know that in poke, when you poke is what you get, right? So, but here it's easier. You see that the opcode are the first, by the first byte here. And, then, and also you can see the uh, encoded value for it, right? It's a byte with value four. Then the registers, uh, again, you could disable pretty print or you could read the source, right? The, the pickle definition of the BPF instruction, or sorry, the BPF instruction registers struct. So you could deduce it from there. But here it is obvious that the register, the registers, uh, in any way they are encoded, they span for one byte. And then it follows the offset, which is 16 bits, and then it follows an immediate, which is 32 bits. Right? Okay. So, um, so we have like the color codes. You can see that in the ASCII part, the, the colors are also used. And in this case, none of those bytes are have a printable representation, because those are all in the ASCII um, codification code, none of those values correspond to a printed value, so we get we get dots there. All right. Um, you can also see here that uh, this list it doesn't span forever, but there is uh, the split, right? Because it's always so nasty when you are using a terminal or something, and then you get so long lines that the terminal sometimes decides to split them, and it, it's it's horrible. So basically, you can see that at some point, Pocket splits the line into new line. It puts a new line here. Uh, this is configurable. You can configure it by setting the value of PK dump. I forgot the name of this. Uh, max line width, which in this case by default is 90, but you can change it if you use. You know, people today they use like huge terminals with thousands and millions of lines and columns. I don't know how can they look at them because the font is so small. But, um, but okay, whatever. I mean, if you are one, if you are one of those people, feel free to. I mean, the, uh, this this variable is has 32 bit sign integer, so you can have up to something like roughly speaking two million, more than two million um, columns in your terminal if you want to. Anyway. <coughs> um, yeah, and uh, also you observe, okay, let's, let me do it again because, yeah. So, also observe that uh, preceding some of the constituents, but not all of them, uh, we have little numbers here. Zero equals opcode, one equals registers, three equals immediate. What is this? Okay, um, when you pass a mapped value to dumbbell, then it indeed it prints all the constituents here uh, with the color codes and everything. Now, um, those little numbers are shortcuts, are shortcuts. Uh, and once you issue the dump command, after you issue the dump command, it may, you, at this point, the shortcut zero is associated with the, the field opcode, the shortcut one is associated with the field registers, and the shortcut three is associated with the immediate. How can you use those shortcuts? Well, the idea is that now you can also do a dump val, and you can use one of the shortcuts. Like, for example, if you want to see the registers, uh, uh, you can use val1, right? Yes, you could have written uh, in three dot registers. But as we can see, as we go down the rabbit hole, the shortcuts are useful. So now we did dump val1. So that one val was the register. So now we are looking at the bytes, uh, the bytes of the registers. And indeed, we can see that source is green here, is this nibble, and destination is this nibble there, right? Now, if we want to to go ahead, well, now, after we execute this dump command, now zero is register and one is destination. So the shortcuts, they get updated. So if we wanted to see the, re the source register, we will see val zero, right? So that's the point, basically. This is, that's the point of the little shortcuts, that you can use them as you go down the rabbit hole or up um, um, you know, like um, looking around, and it's good. Now, w at some point in the rabbit hole, you may forget 
Yeah, you say, okay, so, well, not forget, but lose some sort of losing track. So, okay, I found what it was looking, ab uh, what it was looking for, right? So, I, uh, now I am looking at here, and now I want to change it, or I want to do something with it. Okay, so, another thing that DAMP modifies when, another side effect of running DAMP val, is that it sets, uh, you can use a function, which is called DAMP val, and if you call it with no arguments, it gives, it gives you the value that was used in the last dump val, even if it was using uh, a shortcut. So that's the idea, that's why this is useful. Obviously, if you do dump val instructions 3 and you want the value, you just type instructions 3. But if you go on, like following the shortcuts, you may want the value itself. So, and even, you know, like put it in a variable, right? And operate with it. Usually this is useful when you see the bytes here and then you want to see the value and then you can say, oh, but this is pretty printed, right? So, done val, right? And then you can see, ah, okay, so this is one nibble, this is one nibble, don't, you see? Well, anyway, um, let's enable pretty printing again. Um, yeah. If you pass an argument to dump val, then you can pass one of the shortcuts. So the last dump val command that we issued was uh, for, for this, right? So now if we want the destination register and we want the value, then we can use the shortcut here and it gives us the value, which is again pretty printed. Okay, so that's the, the function of, of dump val. So user level, this is the new feature, this dump val and the dump val function. I'm, Again, we are still designing this, um, so the names may change, well, suggestions welcome, but this is basically the idea, that you m go away, go your way, you know, like following the shortcuts or just typing the values, so you can very easily uh, see both things side to side. And, okay, so let's show you another example that shows you more features of this. Okay, so we are looking at the instructions, right? Which are uh, uh, val instructions, which are you know like stored in the in the text section of the of the L file. Now um, let's look at the debug info, the debug inf the debugging information, which is stored in the BTF section, because it's interesting in by itself. Um, incidentally, right? Uh, what about the L file? Right, right. Well, mm, let's dump the bytes of the L file overall. So we can see that there is a header, an L header that starts at the beginning. It is the green part. And then there are some areas that are not directly uh, mapped in the L64 file poke extract. Those are the contents of the sections precisely. This the BPF instructions and the, the backing info. And then at some point in the file, we have the section header table, which is the red part. And actually, how many sections we have? Well, those are, this is the layout of the section header table in the L file, right? So it is an array of section header entries, section header table entries, which we have the zero one, which is special. We have one, two, three, four, five, ten. So as you can see, the dump val command, it, uh, it's also useful to see uh, big extracts, you know, overall layouts. But anyway, so let's get the section that contains the BTF debug info. So we use, again, get sections by name. The BTF debug info is stored in a section called dot big BTF with big, big letters. And then again, uh, what is the contents of this section, right? So dump from S
table. We can see that there is a BTF header, then there is a, an array of BTF types with a, some number of them. That is not clear because, uh, well, this can be configured in POC, but by default, there is a cutoff value of the number of, you know, if some array is too big, it has too many elements, then it, it cuts it out. You can configure it as well with, uh, with PK08 cutoff, I think it's called. It's in the manual or actually in the help. But anyway, um, all right, so let's take a look to the bytes. Uh, Tamval BTF. So we can see here very easily that there is a header, then there are types, and some types, entries, and then there is a string table at the end. And again, it's very easy to see here to, to see what corresponds to what. So let's take a look to, I don't know, to the, to the types. So let's say that we open, we just open this, you know, and we are just looking around. So we will, we, we get the contents of the section and then we issue this command. And this gives us a very quick, very, very fast and very nice overview. Now let's take a look to the types, right? So BTF types, or we could have used the shortcut, whatever. And this gives us very easily that there are six different types. Uh, but if we are careful looking here, um, it tells us more than that. For example, it tells us that, that the type descriptions, the type the descriptions of BTF types, they can have different lengths, different widths. So, for example, the first two, the first two ones, are clearly 128 bytes long, or 16 bytes. Sorry, bits long or 16 bytes long. However, uh, this one here, the one in yellow it's only uh, 12 bytes long. So, it, it you know, you can see things here. You can also see that they are not aligned because they start the different alignment factors. Uh, you know, it's useful. And you can see very quickly that this, there are six of them. Now, if we are interested in one of them, like for example, this one, the, num the, the fourth, then the number three, because it's the OT there. Um, this time, let's use the shortcut. Shortcut is three. And we can see that there is name, info, attributes, uh, and data. And then again, if at this point uh, we are interested in this particular one for whatever reason, uh, then we can just dump out, sorry, dump out, and then we get the um, the value itself, the value corresponding to those bytes, right? So we can see that the name is 10, it's, a, it's an index in the string table, and so on. Um, to give you an example why this is um, actually, that's why I put it in, in, in the master branch straight away, because it's useful enough, it's immediately useful, even though we will change it maybe and improve it. Um, consider this, yesterday while I was testing this, I was actually looking at data like this, at this data. Uh, so then I did this, and then I wanted to see the string table. So, um, so then I did the string table. Um, a string table is basically um, um, it's a sequence of null terminated strings, and uh, they come one after the other. Then it is very common. It is certainly like that in elf text text sections, but for example in BTF text sections, string tables is the same. There is always an initial entry here, which is uh, which is a null uh, a null um, and it's a null string. You see, this is a null byte. So it's an empty string. It will correspond to an empty string. Although this entry, which should always exist, is not supposed to be used uh, by or referred by anything. And actually, that's why an index zero in a string table is usually used as a no entry or a no index. So if you want to signify that some entity, the name of some entity is absent, then you use the value zero. So here we can see very quickly using the color codes. Well, we can see that there are eight entries in the string table uh, with seven real strings because again the first one is to be discarded and is not used as such and then well we have we have a string here which is long int plus the null terminated null character then we have another string which is a single l which obviously corresponds to that l variable that we 
that we compare in the program we compared at the beginning of the video and we have int uh, null terminated then we have the name of the file uh, that we compiled that it, it's stdin because we 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 feed the program to gcc via a pipe and so on so yesterday when i was debugging this well playing with this then immediately i saw this and it was like okay now this is weird you know i mean because what is this what is this yellow byte here which is zero it's basically an entry in the middle of the string table of an empty of, of an empty string now this is technically correct and it could happen because something may have an empty string as the name but it's weird it's very very unusual because i don't think that there can be uh, because um what is BTF? BTF, you have type description descriptors that uh, they contain information about types like int, long int, you know, and also you have variable entries that gives you information for of, of variables and uh, and so on. But there is nothing in in a BTF section that can have an empty name. I mean, if they have an empty name, if they truly have an empty name, meaning no name, then they will actually have an offset zero to point to the first entry. So this struck me as something weird. So, well, I, I talked to to, Indu, to David Faust and Indu Bagat. They are um, colleagues of mine and they they wrote most of the, well, they work in the BTF and CTF generation from GCC. And then they, and then, uh, they immediately told me, oh no, the uh, this is because GCC uh, internally, so this is an internal implementation detail to to create this uh, string table is actually concatenating two uh, string tables, uh, which come I think one is for Dorf and the other one is for CTF. In any case, so this is a implementation detail, you know, of um, GCC and how it generates BTF. It has no consequences, and um, you know, I mean, it's perfectly fine. It, I mean, it's not a bug, but it shows how uh, a, f a feature like this can uh, basically um, bring your attention very quickly to weird things. Because what are the odds that they will have noticed this if I would have looked at the string table like it really is, as interpreted as a structure, right? Like dumb value. Like an array, right? Uh, look, actually, it, it, unless I will have configured poke to show me more elements, which is, I think it is set we could of uh, I don't know one hundred. Now I could now I will see it. I will see it, but it's not obvious at all, right? So uh, okay, let's stress uh, quite a Okay, set it. Okay, let's set it. Um, or four, I don't know whatever um so yeah so well i mentioned it i mean this is silly it's a stupid example but uh, it's it's interesting right that how can you you know i don't know it's our brains you know you see uh, this is peculiar right and then you look at at why it is peculiar and you find an explanation for it some visual thing i don't know anyway in any case um so this is basically the um, this is basically the the feature um there is another there is one more thing oh yeah um which is the hyperlinks part of it so you have noticed that okay let me go back to let me go back to the pdf stuff you have noticed that um the uh, uh, the little indexes in the cons in the fields or the constituents you have noticed that they are they are links and those links are terminal hyperlinks. In the POC command line interface, we use terminal hyperlinks, which is a quite cool thing. Um, why? What, what, what this hyperlink does? Um, I have another video in the channel explaining about terminal hyperlinks. There are three types of them. There are three kinds. There are insert hyperlinks, execute hyperlinks, and uh, closure hyperlinks that you can actually register any POC function to be executed when the hyperlink gets clicked. But in this case, those particular hyperlinks is that if you click on it, then it will actually 
do a dump val value, value that shortcut. So the idea is that you can navigate around. Now, uh, I noticed yesterday night that um, um, we forgot to uh, to register when there is when a new thread is created uh, as the result of executing 